morning, I'm going to tell you the story of, of two worlds. And we're going to begin here with our own. So, so how many of you in the audience have seen this picture before? Yeah, fairly universal, right? This is one of the iconic images of the space program. How many of you were alive when this picture was taken? OK, a fewer, fewer number in the audience. So I, too, was not alive when this picture was taken. Nevertheless, it's had an extraordinary impact on my career, motivating what I do. And it's a study of contrasts, right? So here we have the beautiful orb of our own Earth. You can make out the clouds. You make out the water. And you know that there's this beautiful, amazing system of ecosystems and life all across this planet, contrasting that with the lifeless, cratered surface of the moon. And you realize how precious this world really is to us. But what is it that allows some planets to sustain environments that support life? What is it that makes some planets habitable? Why do they exist in a way that they could host life for billions of years and others don't? So that takes me to the second world, and that is Mars. So it's not a photo of Mars. This is a, a topographic image of Mars. I, I've rotated the planet so that you're looking down into the, the low northern plains. And, right, and you can see these rivers and these channels snaking in, into this low basin. And you think, wow, did that have an ocean? It sure looks like it had rivers. And yes, we, we now know, yes, it did indeed have rivers. But those of you who have been following the Mars story a little, fourth planet out from the sun, our neighbor, you know, though, that it is cold, it is dry, the atmosphere is incredibly thin, and liquid water does not exist in a long-term, sustainable way on the surface of Mars today. OK, and so the question is, why? What happened? OK, did Mars once look much like Earth? And what caused it to change? We know at least it had rivers. Why did it lose that? Why did it lose its ability to hold water? So those are the questions that really motivate my research. So to place this all in a little bit of context, so I'm a geologist. So time to me, you know, we're talking hours, we're talking years, we're talking centuries. No, no, no. It's about millions and billions of years. And so let me give you just a little bit of a brief history of what's going on at the time we think Mars had water and some critical points for Earth. So uh, up in the corner there, so we, we've got the timeline coming across. We have, in the very early part of solar system history, late heavy bombardment. So meteorites smashing into the surfaces of all the planets, building these planets. I have here just the, the names we geologists use to denote epics, but think about this graph in, in terms of time. So our first rocks on Earth are not from the very beginning, but we have a, a, the oldest mineral, a zircon. We have the oldest rock dating from about 4 billion years ago, so about 500 million years into our planet's history. We get our first rock as a clue. Then coming online at about uh, 3.8 billion years or so ago, we have the first evidence of a rock, the Izua Greenstone Belt, that looks like it's been formed and laid down in liquid water. Shortly after that, we have evidence for the oldest fossil life, 3.5 billion years ago. These little small microbes little fossils preserved in the rocks in Western Australia. So one billion years after the start of our planet, we had life. It's not until much, much later, two billion years, that our atmosphere had the oxygen that we breathe that allowed more complex life forms to evolve, all these different metabolisms, including our own, that takes oxygen that wasn't even there until about, about 2.3 billion years ago or so. So that's a brief history of our own planet. We're limited in our ability to understand that really earliest critical period, though, about what was happening in the solar system. What is the early history of a terrestrial planet like? By virtue of the fact that we have these, these amazing plate tectonic system that recycle crust, build mountains. This is, this is wonderful for geologists to study. But it also means that the, the rock record from that earliest period is destroyed, and far less than 1% remains. Now, as a planetary geologist, I'm very fortunate. I can look to other worlds for clues about what was going on during the first billion years of solar system history. So that takes us to Mars, where over the last 10 years, we've learned that at different points in history, Mars had rivers and lakes. Mars had catastrophic outflow channels releasing large volumes of water. 
And Mars had a number of environments that we would recognize today on Earth, hydrothermal systems, lake basins, groundwater systems that acidic or not, if we found these on Earth today, they would be places where we would find life. So how do we know all this? Well, over the last decades, and, and accelerating really in the last 10 to 15 years, NASA and the European Space Agency have sent a number of orbiter missions. In the first instance, we know about the rovers, but let's take a look at the orbiters. So with increasing spatial resolution, we zoom into the planet. This is a fracture system called Nili Fossae. Successive generations of orbiters, better and better images. You'll see this image get colored in a moment. So we have channel systems that flow down into this fracture. We're going to zoom in now to a very small area, a little postage stamp on the surface, where we also have mineralogical data. We use hyperspectral sensors, infrared data from orbit, to map out minerals. We can get down to an image resolution of 25 centimeters per pixel. And you can start to see all the details of the landscape emerge, right? So we're now at the stage that we're kind of able to do geology on Mars as if we were standing on the other rim of the Grand Canyon, kind of looking out at the layers of the rocks. I'll use the word stratigraphy, this stacking of different rock units. Here, the colors mean that they're made out of different minerals. The key unit here is this blue unit. Um, it's a unit that is rich in clay minerals. And in this particular unit, you can see these, these ridges. You can see layers, right, even within that blue unit. And you can also see these ridges running through it. Well, based on the minerals, these iron magnesium clays it's made out of, along with the morphology of the ridges, we've inferred that this 600 meter stack of sediments was, was altered by hydrothermal fluids flowing through it, altering the rock, creating these zones where liquid, hot liquid water flowed in conduits. And this would have been a great habitat for some of these, these um, hydrothermal microbial organisms that we see on Earth. I'll just take you on a little picture tour of Mars. This is another location, sort of Mars's art here. But um, this, this is another mapping of minerals in a different region of Mars, Marthalus. That bluish, whitish layer that you see is, in fact, a paleo soil, an ancient soil formed on the surface of Mars by water interacting near the surface. This one's a little bit easier to understand. It looks for all the world like the Mississippi Delta, right? Well, that, that is, in fact, it is, in fact, a delta. It's in a large crater, the Jezero Crater. So this is the Jezero Crater Delta. And you can see the channel heading down here and then splaying out into this bird's foot uh, group of sediments that have clay minerals. There's another type of environment, this sort of dry lake environment. So this is a crater. You know, data is a little fuzzier. We don't have complete coverage of this one yet. But so it's also a basin. I'm pointing out a channel heading into it. And you can see that, it, the, so I'm mapping the minerals. And you can see there's been a bathtub ring of salts and clay minerals that have been left behind as the water that was once in this crater evaporated, similar to what you'd get in, in desert environments. And finally, you may, you may have seen pictures like this before. This is uh, from the Meridiani site, where the Opportunity rover landed in 2004. And as we look in that rock record, that stratigraphy at small scale, now from the ground, we're able to look at a scale of centimeters. And you can see that in the rock record, these little ripple marks, particularly on the, um, on the upper right-hand side of this image. So there is evidence of flowing water here at this location, acid groundwaters coming in, shallow pools formed, flowing water, but then evaporation and, and deposition of salt. So were these environments, these are all environments with water. But were these environments ever habitats for life? So to understand this question, it actually requires going back to our own planet. And another set of amazing discoveries over the last few decades has been about life in extreme environments. So that is those places on Earth that are inhospitable, but nevertheless, there are organisms that have evolved to take advantage of these situations. This is an acid saline lake in Australia. Its pH is about 3.5. Nevertheless, uh, in the salt crusts and the iron oxides along the surface, we see microbial life. I was there with a colleague, Sarah Johnson from Harvard, sampling microbial life. And we also take samples of the mineralogy. So to understand exactly, OK, how would we recognize this environment if we see it on Mars? That backpack I'm wearing has a spectrometer that's similar to those that are flying in orbit, collects uh, hyperspectral information on the mineralogy of the rocks. We also go to other types of extreme environments. This is the Askia volcano in Iceland, the caldera lake within. And we did some works here again, sampling the rock record, sampling the mineralogy, trying to understand what it is that lives there, how it's sustained, but also how it is recorded, so how we were able to recognize environments like this on Mars. 
So now, we've learned something from Earth. We've learned that everywhere on Earth where there is water, there's life ecking out of existence. So now, were these Mars environments that we see habitats for life? Okay, to do that, we have to head back to the, our other world. And we do this with rovers on the surface. So how many of you uh, were watching in August as this rover headed to the surface? Was anyone watching that web feed? Uh, it was pretty exciting stuff, right? And, 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 and an amazing success, right? We're able to deliver a rover to the surface of another planet. Well, we've been busy in the intervening eight, eight and a half months exploring the surface. Uh, you can see in the, in the lower corner of this image here, you can see two drill holes from our exploration. First time we've drilled about five centimeters down into the surface of another planet here. So we have been exploring with a suite of instruments. We were investigating the rocks right in front of us. You can see sort of different sedimentary rock units full of clays in an ancient riverbed and perhaps ancient lake inside a large crater, Gale Crater. So we've been studying very carefully now at high, at high uh, with the high resolution images, with mineralogy, with chemistry. We're hunting for organic molecules that might be the recorders of microbes that lived within these sediments. And so we finished up our explorations and we're now getting driving. And, and what's, what's the destination? Well, of course it's the mountain, right? So uh, we're headed now toward this mountain, Mount Sharp, and we're going to start over the coming months, continue to follow our explorations because, um, you know, the landing is, 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 to some people, the end of the story. Yeah, NASA made it. But for those of us scientists and those of us exploring Mars, it's really just the beginning of the story. So over the next year, we're going to be climbing the layers at the base of this mountain. There are important minerals there. We can see from orbit these different rock units recording different types of environmental change. So we're going to be driving up them, trying to figure out what is the history? How do we piece together this detective story about what happened on Mars and how um, its water-rich environments changed and ultimately disappeared? I'll just play here a little kind of movie that shows a bit how we operated. This was, so the rover has an arm and a set of instruments on the arm that do things like scoop to deliver samples into the rover. So this is our very first scooping activity. We wanted to investigate this sand dune here, first of all. So you can see the arm goes, gets placed in the rover track. Then there's a scoop that's deployed. Collector sample, so beneath the Mars dust, we see that there's uh, unaltered materials uh, beneath this rusty Mars surface. We wanted to agitate the scoop to understand, you know, what's the particle size? These are things that a geologist would reach up and, you know, just go like this and then. But this takes, this is a matter of about a week on Mars, step by step, doing the same things that you would do as a geologist in the field. And so we, we, we took a look at the scoop, took a lo look at what was in there. We also delivered another sample into the rover where the chemical instruments got churning to understand the mineralogy, whether there were organics, what it was made out of. And that's the same thing that we did with the material from that drill hole um, in, the, in the sediments. So we're not able, I just told you, it takes a, a week, right, to just go, <laughs> right? <laughs> So we, we are not able to do everything that we want to on Mars. So the other thing we rely on is, is remote instruments. So we have a camera that's great that gets these spectacular pictures. The other thing we now have is, is instruments that get chemistry and mineralogy from a dif distance. So it can do sort of the types of analyses similar to those we do in the lab. So an instrument that's new for Mars is this, is this laser-induced breakdown spectrometer. So yes, we fire lasers at rocks on Mars. <laughs> We don't blow them up. It's not like Star Trek and phasers and stuff. But instead, what we do is we create this little, this little hole. I'm pointing it out to you here, this little, little hole in the rock that will disrupt it. So this plasma that's created, it has these emission lines that come off. And we can get the elemental composition of the rocks from a distance by, by looking at spectral information such as this. And so, so that's the point. We're, we're not acting quite like geologists into the field where we take our samples, go into the lab, then back to the field in the lab. But that technology development is a huge part of our exploration and our ability to access the stories and the discoveries on other worlds. So this is in the lab testing that, that ChemCam instrument that fires its laser out of that location in the mast. All of this effort, the studies on Earth, these studies on Mars, I see them as sort of looking forward to the future we cannot presently visit these worlds. 
that we would like we would like to. I would love love to do geology on the surface of Mars. But the technologies we, we, we develop, the robots we send, they are our proxies. They are the explorers. They are our eyes as explorers of these other planets. So I think you know, one day in the future, the, the shadow of this rover on the surface may in fact be a, a human shadow as we go forward to try to unravel this story about what is it that sustained life? What is it that sustains habitats? And are we alone uh, out in the universe? So thank you. <laughs>